Warning, tonight's presentation, although edited for YouTube, contains imagery and subject matter some may find disturbing. While our program is educational, we still feel that viewer discretion is advised. There, justice served. That's what happens when you go around threatening other people with violence. It feels like every year here on YouTube, the general atmosphere gets more and more depressing. If anything is true, YouTube's response to what should be easy, straightforward policy decisions has been inconsistent at best. I've been here watching in real time for almost a decade, and honestly, I don't have many positive feelings to report. That said, over the years of making these videos, I have seen our community come together in some spectacular ways and at the very least make a bad situation better. Unfortunately, with this worst YouTuber video, the disclaimer at the beginning has never been more true. We're gonna start with some less depressing entries, but eventually it's gonna get real dark real fast. I'll be providing a further disclaimer once we hit that point. But before we dive into the main video, I would like to take some time to thank today's sponsor for helping me pay the editors that really make this all possible. Scentbird is a fragrance subscription that lets you choose a new designer scent to try every month. For just $17, you can afford premium colognes that smell amazing. Look at me getting sprayed in the eye for my art. <gasps> oh. Jeez. I actually work in retail sales, and I could personally say that Cross River Gorilla with its hints of apple and sandalwood has been a hit on the sales floor. I also got a glowing recommendation of Burberry from a friend of mine who's been using the subscription for a while now. Sempert offers over 600 perfumes, colognes, and a lot of unisex options with such brands as Gucci, Parada, and Versace. That combined with plenty of flexible subscription plans and the ability to skip or cancel your subscription at any time makes smelling like the best you a hassle-free experience. With each fragrance, you get a 30-day supply, so you can try out fragrances before committing to a full-size bottle, which can get a bit pricey. To reduce that price even further, my homies over at Semperd is giving everyone watching this video 55% off. Just use coupon code CREEPY at checkout. Coupon code CREEPY for 55% off at Semperd. It's just a little over $7 for your first month, available in the USA and Canada. With uh, that out of the way, I'd like to extend a special thank you to Scentbird, especially since videos like this are at higher risk for demonetization or even risking the channel's health as a whole. So with that said, I'd like to invite you guys to sit back, relax, turn down the lights, and prepare to be disturbed as we explore how a combination of stupidity and uh, negligent behavior creates a dangerous platform for fans and creators alike. Darren Chambers, or That Junk Man, is a YouTuber that covers a variety of topics, most notably the history of a selection of toys and action figures. In the midst of a toy community with quite the amount of creators, Junk Man has repeatedly earned a reputation for himself by picking fights for the dumbest of possible reasons. To start off small with the subject, I will give an example. The YouTuber Analog Toys makes a video where he opens up a sealed toy. This has been sealed in a box since 1987 and today it's coming out. Pretty simple, right? And Junkman, an old man in his 50s, proceeded to get mad about said video because, oh good heavens, somebody opened up a sealed toy. Therefore, it will lose its value because, uh, yeah, that, that's just apparently what matters, I guess. Yes, Junkman is one of those people that relentlessly rails against anything that might take away the value of resold toys because they need to take advantage of a crowd of people to scalp the toys for as much money as possible. Essentially, the worst parasites in a collector's community. To this day, he still regularly antagonizes other creators in the toy community by repeatedly putting them in video thumbnails because those videos generate more views than his average content. However, his main target is Michael French of Retroblasting. Junkman and Retroblasting have been in a feud for quite some time because Junkman would repeatedly start fights with him over opinions on toys. Yes, uh, 
Again, here we are with the toys again. It would quickly devolve into an obsession where he would go on Facebook and constantly parade memes and even shirts with Michael's face plastered everywhere. This reached a peak where Junkman would knowingly start using stolen content from Michael's Patreon on his channel. This content would be used in incredibly low effort memes that, again, were made for the purpose of antagonizing Michael. Michael would then copyright claim that content, causing Junkman to respond with the video. In this video, Junkman would lie to his audience as well as lying to people in the comments about the true nature of the claim. Junkman would claim ignorance to stealing the Patreon content, despite acknowledging where he got it from, keeping in mind the content was originally uploaded to 4chan, and here he is admitting to that, hmm. Now, so far we've at least established that Junkman is incredibly incompetent, but given the title of this video, I mean, where does the dangerous part come in? Well, uh, a few things actually. Now, despite being open about wanting to engage in drama, as he calls it, let's start drama. Junkman has quite the history of not responding very well when he himself receives a lot of criticism for his actions. I do not want drama, guys. Let's start drama. For example, Junkman in 2021 would levy false allegations of grooming towards another toy channel, Lyo Convoy. He had literally no evidence to this at all, and the supposed grooming victims all would come out and say that Junkman was full of BS in his allegations. So so obviously, Lyo Convoy would fire back with a live stream defending himself, and Junkman would purposefully avoid a confrontation with him soon after despite donating Super Chats and acting so excited about it. Keeping in mind, he never apologized. At all. When you wrong somebody so severely like this, you can at least apologize but he couldn't even do that. Instead of doing that, Junkman would frequently delete comments that criticized his actions and deny the fact that any of it happened at all. He would go as far as to throw conspiracy theories that Michael French was somehow responsible for all of the criticism that he received. This man is truly delusional. Even when he does something as egregious as this, he just can't take any accountability, which is a running theme. But of course, I'm still not done. Junkman's biggest debacle was when he was exposed for being a serial catfisher. And while this occurred many years ago, to this day, he just tries to play it off as just a big joke. However, in reality, it was not really much of a joke at all. It was actually pretty messed up. So the people that he was known to fish were actually a couple of individuals, one of which was Jordan Hembro of Hollywood Heroes. Junkman would, uh, get in touch with Jordan Hembro to, uh, you know, learn how collecting works. Yeah, uh, okay. Now, Jordan Hembro wouldn't be the last person he would catfish. He actually catfished more people. He would be doing all of this under an account called Self Cutting Girl. Yes, he would pretend to be a 14 year old girl with self harming issues as a grown adult. He would then go on to catfish some radio guys from the Opie and Anthony show. Now, of course, this one is a little bit more messy because things were actually sent to Junkman via this catfishing. During this specific instance, Junk Junkman did receive $200 in other items. Junkman would defend himself later on, saying that, well, actually these people were groomers and they were sending stuff to what they thought was a 14-year-old girl, so therefore that is pretty creepy. Which, you know what? I think he's correct. However, that doesn't excuse what he did at all. Because regardless of what happened, you still did it, and you also got free items out of it. When Junkman was originally caught, he actually blamed it on a terrible lifestyle. Junkman many years ago said that he was going through a divorce, he was having his house foreclosed on, pretty harsh stuff. And because of this, he decided to, uh, start catfishing people, I guess. However, in a response that is now taken down, he did try to clarify that, oh, it was just, it was just something that went way too far, guys. But I will ask you to ask yourself this. Would four grown men, all way over the age of 40, really send who they thought was a 14-year-old girl expensive things and try to meet up with them all social media, all because they just wanna have a friend or be nice? And if any of those four are watching, this goes out to one of you. I can't back it up, but you know, I know, and others know what you said about a stepdaughter. That's the story of Kenner Babe. I was dumb, and it really got out of hand and snowballed into a lot more than it ever should have been. What should have been just fun goofing around with some radio guys got really out of control. You see, I was only goofing around when I was catfishing people and getting free stuff. Yeah, he can't be consistent either with his original response and what he responds with now. It just doesn't make any sense. However, what makes this even worse is the fact that he used an actual girl's photo and identity to facilitate his fraud. He started to want to meet Alyssa, which was this 
apparently this girl's real name. Um, I started not to talk to him much. However, he wanted to send me money for helping me and I gave him my real PayPal account because you're such a smart cookie, Darren. Um, saying that it was a family friend. That is how he got my name. A friend of his then um, did a reverse Google image search of the pictures that I use as Alyssa and found her photo bucket. I was busted. Um, the hunter then told my female friend and then told Sam, who told Anthony. There's a number of very, very concerning things going on here. This girl, Alyssa, is a real person um, who is completely innocent and this guy stole her photographs to bolster his fraud, his lie. He put a young, innocent girl in danger by doing this and he doesn't seem to care. He admits he got greedy. He was not trying to get anyone arrested. He was trying to get money out of Jordan Hembro after he'd been scamming him online. He'd been catfishing him and he got caught and he admits it. Again, he would have no problem admitting to this in the past, but he really doesn't want to talk about it in detail now. While not the most dangerous toy reviewer that will be discussed in this video, Junkman, regardless, is a dangerously incompetent content creator that doesn't care about taking any accountability for his actions. He doesn't care for the damage he's inflicted on other content creators in the toy community, and he certainly doesn't care about lying to his audience on a regular basis. The Completionist is a YouTuber whose videos fit that niche cross-section of review and challenge run. Much like the name suggests, Gerard has gained quite a bit of an audience, completing each game and then reviewing what it's like to actually 100% that title. And we get to see what's going on along the way. In 2013, Gerard and his family started the Open Hand Foundation in honor of his late mother who suffered from dementia. According to Gerard, the foundation would take donations made during live streams and fundraising events, then distribute that across a few organizations across the world that would band together and fight dementia. For about 10 years, this is the narrative everyone believed, that when they donated money, the money they sent would be distributed to several charities, without you needing to do the legwork of making sure they're doing what they actually said that they're doing. The Open Hand Foundation would raise hundreds of thousands of dollars and become a overwhelming success in the past 10 years or so. When raising funds, Gerard even evoked his deceased family as a call to action. This is the fifth year that we've been spotlighting indie games and raising money for dementia research in honor of my mother's passing with her over decade long battle with frontotemporal dementia. Thanks to the efforts of Mudahar from Some Ordinary Gamers and Carl Jobs, we now know that they have not donated a single cent of money to any organization that they said that they would, which according to Carl Jobs, would mean that this quote featured prominently on their charity's website is a knowing lie. Their website clearly states they support the UCSF. And they have a quote from David Kessler, the Dean of the UCSF School of Medicine, thanking them for their gift. But the interesting thing about David Kessler is that he was fired as the Dean of the UCSF School of Medicine in 2007, seven years before Open Hand was even officially registered. Carl and Muda in their own respective videos go in depth over the warning signs and red flags pulled from Open Hand's publicly available tax filings, which shows that this organization has spent over $100,000 in a administrative expenses for a charity that's only stated goal is to donate to other charities and they have failed to do that even once. To make this even more troubling, these expenses are not broken down in any way, so we don't know why one year the Open Hand Foundation spent $10,000 while another year the charity spent over thirty-five. dollars I think that number, over $100,000, needs to be heavily stated because over half a million dollars were given to this organization, and yet for some reason, the only expense getting paid is undefined. This lack of breakdown is not exactly normal for charities to engage in, and I don't understand how anyone can defend spending this donated money at all for any expense when they have consistently 
failed to do one of their only stated goals for a decade. This is made especially egregious since Gerard, in his own humble words, objectively states he's known about the issue since 2021 and has yet to donate the money due to high standards. I knew it was sitting there at a certain point, and that's what made me proactively go about it. Like, Do you know when that point was? I was made aware in 2021 where the, the, the money hadn't moved yet. Okay. And that's what made me go, that's not cool. And that's what I got personally involved to move in. And did anyone? 2021, last year, 2022. Yeah, did anyone tell you that the, the, the money was going somewhere before then? Were you being misled? No, 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 no one told me anything. I was, I assumed that it was all going to a charity and I, I assumed it correctly. According to Muda, he later said 2022, regardless, this is like a whole year of sitting on this money and refusing to donate any of it. Gerard, in a call with Carl and Muda, does provide a explanation, but if I'm reading this right, it seems like this explanation is just him asking for more money because they won't donate it unless they reach a certain goal? So I know I have a paper trail of us talking to other organizations as early as 2020 and 2021 in an attempt to pay them what they were owed. And most of the conversations we had from from um, some of the bigger orgs like Alzheimer's, they were like, look, if you're not going to pay more than six figures or, or six plus figures of what they asked for, then you're just going to waste it. So the goal on the back end for my family that I've been told is like, we're just going to raise a bunch of money and then give it to one org and like make a bigger impact rather than just giving smaller donations that don't move the needle. I normally have a policy on focusing on the actions of a creator and not their family, but even when confronted, Gerard couldn't help but bringing up his dead mom, as though that somehow helps his case. Even as he's confronted with the irrefutable, publicly available IRS tax filings, he acts defensively and seems to imply that my main man Muda is some sort of Z-tier commentary bro, whose only interest with the lack of charity begins and ends with the drama content. What do you want me to do as soon as possible? If it's like, hey, Gerard, we want you to shut up and take the L so we can make content, that's fine. If that's what you guys think is the way to go to call it a scam, sure. But I'm not trying to scam anyone. I would never try and scam in honor of my mom. Like, this is, I, I would not be outward facing knowing that I can get right to the coals for this. This isn't drama. This is erroring at best at severe negligence or it could go into actual charitable fraud. What is important is that Gerard had over two years to donate any amount of money to anyone, and he's been nothing but evasive when trying to get an explanation. It would be so easy for them to prove that the money is there, but they won't, and the only way we'll ever know what the actual truth is is if the IRS or some other agency investigates further. I only hope that the next thing Gerard completes is a check to the UCF School of Medicine, so at least that way they can keep the quote on the website. Illuminati is a channel that used to have a lot of respect here on YouTube. Unlike many people on our list, the problems stem from the content they create. Illuminati is the opposite. Looking to our content before all this happened, it not only spread awareness to important issues like MOMs, the anti-vax movement, but with huge asterisks here, actually is well produced. So how do we get to this point? Unfortunately, when working on projects like this, you hit a situation that is so needlessly complicated that going over every detail would take longer than reading the Bible cover to cover. So in the interest of not getting lost in the details, we like to briefly go over what happened and highlight a few situations that justifies the phrase cartoon villain. Illuminati in April 20, 2023 accused Legal Eagle's editor of trying to steal her channel's style. She cited the use of commonly used highlighting effects and paper textures? Turns out in an email, it shows that Legal Eagle's editor just wanted to know how Blair's team recreated the NFL logo. Needless to say, this was silly and the collective internet started the roaster. H Bomber Guy added to the conversation that Blair's own content was not free from plagiarism and theft itself. In the wake of these claims, creators close to her depart from the group called Satin Elk. They also started to come forward with rather disturbing claims. In a video we'll talk about in a second, she tries to defend herself from plagiarism with the classic, no, I'm actually not a plagiarist defense, but this Twitter clip from content creator Bob's Vids concisely debunks that. It's most certainly not plagiarism. Yeah, it actually is. You can't just drop the source from a quote and be like, no, I did it. 
That, that's literally plagiarism. This is literally plagiarism. What are we even doing here? Bob's Fids makes great videos here on YouTube, and you can check them out in the channel description. Manipulative is the best way to describe Illuminati behind the scenes. Eight days after calling out Legal Eagle, Illuminati uploads the video called Illuminati Exposed. She spends 41 minutes lying, twisting, and omitting details surrounding the expanding of Sad Milk as well as the creators involved with that. The creators mentioned are a click, Oz, or X, but it is mostly over a person called Wonderstruck. I want to be clear and say that nothing she brings up about any of these creators hold any water, and in fact, we'll soon learn Illuminati twisted many of the situations to make it seem like she was not as bad as the guy as she actually was. Starting with the Wonderstruck guy, she mostly shames him while justifying repossessing his car. Later in the early hours of July 29th, 2021, Blair flew down to obtain the BMW. Hours after I agreed to pay for the car's appreciation value, under the condition that I was paying what was accurate and visible to me. And throwing away his YouTube play button? What she fails to show in her video is my skateboard, both my Sad Milk and Wonderstruck Guy play buttons, my $800 GoPro set, and a whole list of other items I was prohibited from obtaining. Which I found out recently from Oz, these items were subsequently thrown in the trash after some time. Again, cartoonishly evil behavior. After looking into this, the scariest takeaway you get over these responses is the recurring theme of people who are fairly young, learning they're indebted and could have their finances ruined in a moment's notice by their employer. Well, maybe that isn't so bad. I do, in fact, have a car, I have a house, and I have a job. However, the one scary thing when you put all that on a spectrum is they are all provided by one singular individual. Blair. In the beginning, Blair walked me into several poor financial decisions. Oz Media, Blair's ex, actually got into contact with Wonderstruck and patched things up between the two, which at the very least is one good outcome to come of this. I was still very much on edge with my trust, but over the last few months, Oz has made countless efforts to prove not only to me, but to every other former Sad Milk member that he truly was sorry for the role he played in anything that took place. As of now, Oz Media is actively raising funds to defend himself in court, while also producing another video that would show new receipts and go into more detail about unspecified white collar crimes. Unfortunately, this video has been somewhat delayed by the fact that Blair is foreclosing on his home the day before Christmas. Right now, what is undisputed is that Blair has lied about people with the explicit purpose of ruining their reputation. Also that she's willing to plagiarize content, and instead of owning up to that and moving on, she would rather lie about said plagiarism just to save her ego. And if you cross her, she would use every connection she has to make your life hell, both socially and financially. We wish Oz Media best of luck with their video and hope that Wonderstruck is able to move on from this because they both deserve better. Zaid Magenta, formerly known as Miss Anthropony, created video essays criticizing woke media with a focus on Star Wars and the live action Disney movies. Many of you might remember Zaid from the video Miss Anthropony, Blackmailer Manipulator Snake, uploaded on March 11th, 2022 by Cartoon Chi. In this video, Cartoon Chi presents solid evidence that Zaid engaged in a campaign to manipulate, blackmail, and repeatedly harass what at the time was a minor. He used sock puppet accounts to harass and and threaten while also defending himself from criticism. This is not up for conjecture. Zaid himself has acknowledged that he would just chase his detractors across multiple websites over Star Wars. Now, after this, it was believed that Zaid has stopped and started to make serious strides in his life to focus on his own content. Unfortunately, unbeknownst to his friends in the content creation community, Zaid in secret continued to engage with this behavior. Just instead of targeting larger creators like Creepy or Cartucci, he went after random commentators, detractors, and a few aforementioned unhinged people. Creepy tried to confront him in Senate, a Discord server full of his peers at the time, over the fact that he was going around calling himself the Wrangler, as well as calling people across three different websites for not debating him again over Star Wars and identity politics. This concerning behavior continued until Creepy started to see more violent messages, like him describing how he would see a knife jammed through someone's skull, or how another group of people should be gunned down by cartel members for causing his continued mental anguish? These messages may never cross the line of saying, I'm going to hurt you or visit your home, but often wished death against those he deemed harassers and stalkers. Zaid struggles to see who's just just disagreeing with the take on Star Wars, or the way he just chooses to engage the discourse with legitimate, obsessive behavior. He even used to have this massive Google Doc with about 50 folders, all with usernames that corresponded to a person that wronged or harassed him. Even after he was confronted about this by Creepy, both in the comments of his post and in a voice chat, 
he still chose to keep doing it. Creepy then gathered his evidence and handed it off to me. As a result of this continued behavior, Zaid lost the rest of his peers and was promptly removed from many circles. In the wake of this, he attempted to make a few apology posts and eventually a video that Creepy and I responded to. And to prove to myself that this is genuine and I won't go back on anything oh, no. I've said in this video. Uh... What's happening? No more burner accounts. What? No more angry messages. What's happening? I'm I think that's his dead dad's heart. Managed. Uh. I. Um. I think his father died recently, and that's like a memento type thing. I'm. I'm, I, you know, I'm just not going to say anything. I, I'm going to say something right now. This is very emotionally manipulative. For context, that was a memento from a dead relative. And he did... You know what? Just, just don't do this in your YouTube apologies, please. In that video, me and Creepy may have uh, heavily implied he should just get rid of his channel and take a break from the internet. As a result of this, Zaid just deleted his channel. And as of right now, um... Well, yeah, I guess he did stop. I feel it's important to disclose the fact that I have not only been a fan of Boogie since uh, the beginning, but I've also met him IRL at a VidCon or two. This segment sucks to write too because this guy used to be the Mr. Rogers of YouTube. When I was in some pretty tough moments in my own life, this guy's stories and reassurances really helped not only me, but a ton of other people out there. Boogie's passionate fan base used to defend him vigorously whenever anyone was cruel to him or made fun of him for being fat, but now his fan base is justifiably there to watch the trash fire that is his life in light of many, many, many controversies he's been involved involved in over the years, most of which involves his toxic self-defeating personality and is not the subject of today's list. What makes Boogie dangerously stupid and does qualify him for our list, however, isn't the bridges that he burned or the hundreds of thousands of dollars that he squandered. Instead, it's the opposite of the Jax film situation. Imagine if, instead of staying inside of his house, Jax met Sniper Wolf with a loaded revolver. In 2020, Boogie had been the target of harassment from Frank Hassel, an internet troll who gained notoriety by hassling people in public to make content out of their reactions and flaunting his disregard of the pandemic's guidelines. Unfortunately, everyone in this story kind of sucks. But when it comes to getting reactions out of Boogie, Hassel made it an art form. Believing that he was the cause of his channel's termination, Hassel had been provoking Boogie for months, to which Boogie completely played into his hand, responding with DMs like, you're welcome to kill me, but leave my friends and dog out of it, and even claiming that he was willing to participate in being demeaned. So thoroughly did Boogie feed his troll that he appeared on the kill stream and drama alert to debate Hassel, showing that he was more inclined to monetize their feud than pursue de-escalation. During the drama alert stream, Boogie even threatened to kill Hassel should he step foot on his property in Arkansas, claiming that he had been messing around before, but now he's in full tough guy internet mode. Hassel would call his bluff the very next day, knocking on Boogie's door with a GoPro strapped to his head with the intention of calling him fat some more. While Boogie would have been been in his right to contact the police at this point, Boogie instead willingly left his locked home to wave a revolver around, brandishing the weapon while making threats in an attempt to get the troll to back down. Despite the fact that he had gone outside to engage, Boogie would claim that he felt unsafe and reiterated that he would fire a warning shot. Eventually, Hassel called him fat one too many times and the madman actually did it and fired his gun. Stepping away from firing a gun in a school zone, let's talk about the concept concept of a warning shot and gun safety. If you take away anything from this list, I want you guys to understand that guns are not toys and are probably the most dangerous thing you could bring into almost any situation, let alone an internet beef. The reason why Boogie is currently a felon is because he fired a warning shot. In other words, after trying to provoke this unhinged guy into a WWE-like spectacle, Boogie pulled out a gun, not to defend himself, but as a matter of 
tried. He should have stayed inside and called the police if he truly felt like he was in danger, only using the gun should his life actually be in danger. Instead, this is a internet pissing match where Frank Hassel truly became the worst thing ever to happen to Boogie since arguably Boogie himself. Sniper Wolf, or Elias Alash, is a YouTuber that everyone's been talking about the last few months. Though she has been consistently embroiled in controversy over her decade-long career on YouTube. Take for instance this deleted video, where Leah hypocritically calls out another girl gamer for faking her footage. It gives me and a lot of my subscribers the impression that she doesn't actually get her gameplays. And there have been hundreds of comments on my videos about how she's not the one playing. Though today is well documented that Leah's own gameplay is fake. Or about the time she blew off a scheduled meeting with a terminally ill fan in order to enjoy chocolate cake at a fancy restaurant. Leah had promised to meet a fan in person a 10 year old named Kiara who was bad on cancer, but only relented and sent the girl a video message after public backlash due to the ghosting. It's easy to get lost in the weeds when it comes to all the toes that Wolf have stepped on and all the enemies she has made. She is most well known for her Jinx style reaction videos featuring mostly lifted content from TikTok. Despite what Leah would have you believe, she did not invent reaction content. And in fact, her reactions have received criticism for being low effort as well as lacking credit to the creators she reacts to. In October 2022, Jack's Films announced the creation of a second channel called to Jack's films to poke fun at Sniper Wolf's lazy, freebooting method of content creation. Originally intended as parody, the purpose of the secondary channel would elevate to documenting stolen content to giving credit to the original creators where Leah failed to do so. So spot on were Jack's films criticism to the reactions being lazy and predictable that one fan created a bingo card out of Sniper Wolfisms, which was regularly filled out in Jack's film streams. We have our very first bingo victory of the night! Jack's films would criticize Sniper Wolf's content on Twitter with treats like this one to which Leah responded abysmally, mocking Jack Swim's appearance and view counts and insinuating that the criticism is a result of her being a female content creator. In videos like Let's Talk About Sniper Wolf and Sniper Wolf is Getting More Is His Proof, Jack Swim's levied harder criticisms against Leah's reaction content, proving not only her reactions were sometimes stolen or reused, but also exposing her for explicitly removing creators' credits from the freebooted videos. Not only was Jack Swim's working to identify creators whose work had been stolen, but also encouraged these victims to file a removal request to YouTube and stand the ground against content theft. This is happening now. All this been too much pressure for Sniper Wolf, who crossed the line October 13th, 2023, violating Jack Swim's privacy and putting him and his family's safety at risk. Leah began posting a poll to her Instagram story, quote, Should I go visit at Jack's Films? He lives five minutes away from my shoot, yes or no. It seems that she's already made up her mind, however, as before the results came in, Cyberwolf had already begun to record and post outside Jackson's house to 5 million Instagram followers, deleting the post just hours later. Jack was indoors and streaming at the time when his chat made him aware of the situation, and it's impossible not to feel sympathetic for the guy, seeing his reaction to confusion and disbelief. Even in the place of the brazen and threats, Jackson's acted professionally, ending the stream before tweeting at Team YouTube to call in the action of Cyberwolf's doxing. If you watched the video, you're probably aware of the unspoken rule. Arguments that happen online stay online. You don't just show up at someone's address because of internet beef, much less make the address accessible to millions of your followers. Posting footage of someone's home to your followers or presenting that person as an adversary is even worse and creates a clear and present danger. All it takes is one upset fan to take things too far, to instigate for the stalking or god forbid someone to get hurt. Sniper Wolf would engage in new forms of damage control following the incident. Her first attempt was to paint herself as a victim, claiming she didn't have any ill intentions and that Jack was the one harassing her, pointing to the secondary channel we mentioned earlier. This is a poor defense because, as we outlined, the purpose of Jack's film's channel has been parody and criticism, while also documenting stone content to giving credit to the original creators. They would also try to make light of the situation by presenting the doxing as a quirky meme, and even insinuated that Jack's films is a coward for not engaging with her. It was clear from her response she didn't feel any remorse and even seemed to think she was in the right. In the wake of the controversy, evidence also surfaced of another YouTube community guideline which Sniper Wolf is in violation of, posting content which sexualizes minors. In the video Girl on Omegle with over 2 million views, Leah learns that she is chatting with a 16 year old before proceeding to convince the underage girl to flash her breasts. This is in addition to other Amigo videos which have surfaced, in which Leah encourages underage chatters to twerk for her. There's also documentation of Sniper Wolf removing these videos from her YouTube channel, deleting the evidence as the incriminating videos are brought to light. This appears to be a page taken out of Shane Dawson's playbook. Edgy jokes, the punchline is kids in sexual situations. While this information does not necessarily make Leah a predator, 
It does make her a gross creep in addition to someone who stalks and doxes their critics. After the doxing incidents and learning about Cypher Wolf's various guidelines violations, many YouTubers called for her to be deplatformed, though they would not be vindicated. Team YouTube released their official statements a week later, confirming that they only levied a temporary monetization suspension against Cypher Wolf while keeping the details vague. The response from YouTube is downright insulting, as this is not only a clear example of YouTube playing favorites in selectively enforcing their policy, but also claims that both parties are at fault and simply not the case. Only one of these creators is guilty of stalking, harassment, and doxing. It is unequivocally Sniper Wolf in the wrong. While Leah would go to post this apology, which reads like something generated by ChatGPT, she makes no mention of the doxing, misspells the name of the person she apologizes to twice, and thanks YouTube for their downright limp response. But we're all trying to guess if the apology is the output of a chatbot or a member of Team YouTube. Here's Sniper Wolf explaining what she did wrong in one of her old videos. I love meeting you guys, but just this person that took it a step too far to follow me home, like don't do that, don't follow people home. All of the YouTubers on our list have abused their platform in one way or another, whether it was acting irresponsibly, putting others in danger, or even causing tragedy offline. The next entry on our list takes this a step further, abusing their platform in order to form an alibi and circumvent the law with every intention of causing pain and suffering. Vote Saxon 07 or Stephen McCullough, is a toy reviewer and Doctor Who fan who would break a nearly year-long live-streaming hiatus in December of 2022, broadcasting himself playing GTA Vice City on YouTube in a stream which he would title Violent Night. What more could you want for Christmas other than a, a, an evening with your old pal Steven? There is overwhelming evidence to suggest that this pre-recorded live stream had been faked by McCola to provide him with a six-hour-long alibi in the murder of his pregnant partner. Natalie McNally. McCola was brought in for questioning promptly when he contacted police to report that he found the mother-to-be stabbed to death inside of her own home the morning after the incident. He was released after questioning, however, and his status was downgraded from suspect to witness due to the livestream he had purportedly hosted from 6 p.m. to midnight on the evening of the murder. There were a few red flags in the live stream at the time of upload, such as McCullough's claim that he was unable to interact with chat due to a number of technical difficulties that would supposedly cause his OBS to crash. Because this streaming software is kind of up the left, it means I can't check the live chat. Which is a real shame. Despite this, he would go out of his way to insist several times that the stream was in fact live. McCullough's bogus alibi would be broken six weeks later when forensic computer analysis determined that the live stream had been pre-recorded, even managing to acquire the video file which had been broadcast on YouTube. McCullough would admit to faking this live stream, therefore falsifying an alibi, though he also changed his story to claim that he had spent the evening blackout drunk instead. Video and forensic evidence would also serve to connect McCullough from his home in Lisburn to the murder scene. CCTV footage would show the YouTuber using public transportation to arrive at Natalie's home around the time when her neighbors heard a scream, later leaving in a change of clothes to catch a ride home. McCullough also wore a pair of yellow latex cleaning gloves beneath a pair of black gloves in the CCTV footage, traces of which had been detected at the crime scene. What McCullough had intended to be an alibi now served as strong evidence that the murder had been premeditated. He had planned to kill his partner and unborn child for some time in advance. A search through McCullough's devices and browsing history would reveal that in the weeks leading up to the murder, he had been casually researching the most painful ways to die. His internet searches compared and contrasted things like, is it more painful to be shot in the head or the heart, among other methods of execution, which is less painful, drowning or burning to death? Would you rather be drowned or be shot? Is drowning a painful way to die. The premeditation went so far that McCullough began to hide what the prosecution described as brazen and taunting hidden messages, or Easter eggs, regarding Natalie's death, which would play in the faked broadcast around the time of her murder. An example of this is when McCullough replaced his live stream back soon break screen with a promotional image of the James Bond film No Time to Die during a break which coincided with Natalie's time of death. Word for word, 
time to die. There is also this chilling clip where he looks to the camera while smirking and invokes his victim's name. Uh-huh, yeah, that's, that's physics. That's, that's what would happen in the real world. That's a fucking notly. Hmm, absolutely fucking natly. Prosecution barrister Natalie Pinkerton, who would go on to oppose bail for the accused YouTuber, had this to say. The degree of planning and level of sophistication shown by the individual who has committed this crime, along with premeditation, deceit, and efforts to conceal, is something that the courts in this jurisdiction will rarely have seen. Vote Saxon 07 is not only dangerous or just stupid, but in our humble opinion, objectively evil. Perhaps most chilling of all is the way that McCullough integrated himself with his victim's family following his initial release from custody, playing the role of the grieving partner in order to divert suspicion from himself. Not only did he insidiously spend time at Natalie's family home, consoling her parents and even attending Natalie's justice rally, he also left his phone inside of their house to bug them, recording their conversations to determine whether he was a suspect. McCola was able to twist the sympathy of the victim's family in order to get close with them, though they weren't the only ones tricked into believing that he wasn't secretly capable of something so awful. Viewers who had supported Vote Saxon 07 for years were left appalled and sickened as the content creator they had come to respect revealed himself to be a monster in real life despite the fact that they never expected it. McCola went to great lengths to mask his evil and reduce his culpability, leaving his viewers and his loved ones manipulated and betrayed. In times like these, we can only say our thoughts are with the McNally family, who unfortunately had Natalie and young Sean taken from them, and now we hope justice will come to the perpetrator of this heinous act. Without mincing words, the borderline is a Italian Mr. Beast clone which capitalized on bringing his style of challenge less influencer content to non-English speakers who are unfamiliar with the original. The about section of the channel, which would later come to be deleted, admitted that the group drew inspiration from Mr. Beast, though it would be more accurate to say that they lifted video ideas wholesale. These videos often included endurance-based challenges for the channel's founder, Matteo Di Pietro, and his friends to endure, such as spending 24 hours on a ferris wheel or 50 hours living in a cardboard box. The Borderline would go on to achieve over 600,000 subscribers in just two and a half years with videos regularly gaining millions of views. Though, this success would eventually come to a screeching halt when a challenge involving spending 50 consecutive hours in a Lamborghini took a fatal turn. From what we can tell, the challenge would have played out similarly to a road trip, with the caveat that nobody is allowed to leave the vehicle over the course of the 50 hours. Matteo rented a Lamborghini Urus, which is a luxury sports vehicle worth hundreds of thousands of dollars and is capable of reaching 200 miles per hour. The intention seemingly being that he and three friends would take turns driving and recording footage for their YouTube channel. One of these influencers, Vita Loyacuno, can be seen in this TikTok bragging about the speed and value of the luxury car, mocking smart car drivers, and generally making an ass of himself. It's also worth mentioning that the only reason why I have access to this footage is because of Scott Schaefer's video on the incident, as the borderline was quick to purge evidence of the driving challenge from their social media profiles. Vito's TikTok is very telling regarding the attitudes of the borderline going into this challenge, seeing it as an opportunity to garner attention by flexing wealth and acting recklessly, while his comment on smart cars foreshadows the tragedy that would ensue. Matteo had been behind the wheel at the time of the collision. Italian authorities would reveal that the novice driver had been accelerating to reckless speeds in order to overtake other drivers, and they did this while recording themselves taunting the other drivers. It was during one of these high-speed maneuvers that Matteo collided head-on with a smart car in the Casal Paloco region of Rome. Inside that smart car was a five-year-old Manuel Peretti and his four-year-old sister being driven by their mother Elena. Unfortunately,
Unfortunately, Manuel didn't make it and died upon arrival at Grassy Hospital, though his mother and sister would recover from their injuries. The phones of all four influencers were seized as evidence, and Italian politicians would call for the immediate suspension of their social media accounts. The Italian Minister of Transportation and Infrastructure would also go on to comment on the tragedy, calling for stricter laws against reckless driving. If you are a repeat offender and take a person's life because you are a jerk behind the wheel, you don't get to see their license for the rest of your life. It's not like I'll just suspend it for a few months. Whether as a desperate attempt to save face, garner sympathy, or remove evidence, the borderline would be busy in the next few days following the collision, deleting millions of views worth of videos from their YouTube channel. Eventually, the group would post a video titled after the day of the collision, 1406. 2023. The video itself is just a still frame expressing sorrow to Manuel's family and explaining that the borderline will be stopping all activity and disbanding. On the 23rd of June, Mateo was arrested and charged of vehicular homicide and now faces house arrest with contact to the outside world prohibited. Before you click off the video, I'd just like to thank you for making it this far, and also to let you know that I'm going to be doing a part 2 to this somewhat soon. There's a bunch of stuff that I had to cut just due to time and for my own mental sanity, especially when you're producing long-form content. It can be absolutely mind-numbing and very difficult to do when you work 40 hours at a retail job. Thankfully, videos like this are made possible thanks to the amazing people on Patreon, whose donations not only grant them access to every song that I've ever had made for the channel, but also a exclusive Discord where we'll talk about lists and hang out sometimes and watch cartoons. I'm a massive stoner, so you can imagine what I'm doing in there. Starting with the next video, I'm going to be putting back up the uh, Patreon wall that shows all the top donators so we can show a little more appreciation for the work that those guys are doing behind the scenes, because honestly, this wouldn't be possible without them. Thanks for watching. I'll hope I'll see you on Christmas. Goodbye.